All right. Let's go ahead and open a prayer. Now, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, the blessing that it is to gather together as, as men of God, uh, to worship you, to hear your word. We pray that you would bless our time together, that you would edify us and that you would strengthen us. Uh, indeed, as we consider these qualifications of eldership, we pray that you would uh, conform our own characters to this standard and that we would know the joy and the blessing it is to lead your church accordingly. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Uh, so, of course, for those of you who know and have been here uh, in the series, we're working through the qualifications uh, for eldership. And the next qualification that we come across is the qualification apt to teach. Uh, the elder must be uh, apt to teach. Excuse me. Oh. Let's get this running. There we go. Or, as the ESV puts it, able to teach. You have the older language, apt to teach. He's fit to teach. He's qualified to teach. So far, as we've been considering these qualifications, you'll note that all of the others are moral qualifications. So just as a review up to this point, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable. All of those are moral qualifications. This uniquely is not a moral qualification. Just because someone isn't fit to teach does not make that person uh, somehow immoral or, or they're not in any way violating necessarily the moral law. And so uh, this, this qualification is unique in this respect. And yet, having said that, it does not mean that this qualification is only applicable uh, to those who hold the office of elder or minister in the church. It is important for that purpose, but it is not exclusive and limited to uh, that function. So what we're going to look at is, I want to look at three questions here. One is, who teaches? So again, this is applicable more broadly beyond the boundaries of the office of elder. Who teaches? How they teach? And what do they teach? So we'll start with who teaches. Well, we begin with uh, perhaps uh, the most obvious teacher, uh, and yet sometimes we, we may overlook it because it's so obvious, is God himself. God himself teaches. So we see the language, for example, in Psalm 8611. The psalmist says, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I, may, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. So the psalmist is calling on God to teach him. We see the same thing, for example, in Psalm 9412. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law. Or yet again, you can look at Psalm 119, and throughout Psalm 119, this uh, the longest psalm, of course, and a psalm about the Word of God, we see a repeated uh, call by the psalmist for God to teach him in verses 12, 26, 29, 33, 64, 68, and so on. So what that means for this particular qualification is the standard of teaching is God himself. He is uh, the teacher par excellence, and so we ought to emulate and follow after his method of teaching as well as the content of teaching. And so as we look at the uh, next two questions, how to teach and what to teach, uh, both of those are going to be informed by how God teaches us. So the next, of course, is, and I'm going to try to make use of this available space. So we have God. The next is Christ, of course. Christ is the incarnate God, but we have a particular model of teaching in Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, and so we see, for example, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, this language. And he went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Uh, later on, we'll see in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, uh, the summary that Luke gives there of his first uh, volume, the, the Gospel of Luke. He says that he wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And so we have not only God's teaching throughout Scripture as a whole, but we have specifically Christ's own teaching in his earthly ministry. So again, as we consider both the method and the content of teaching, we ought to keep in mind that Christ is the model here, and that 
uh, he is the model not only, again, for what we ought to say, but even how we ought to say it. In fact, at least as far as the content is concerned, this becomes apparent at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. You all are familiar with the Great Commission given there. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So the teaching of the church, the teaching that particularly, as we'll see in a moment, officers uh, are entrusted to give, is the teaching that Jesus gave in his earthly ministry. He is the model for our teaching. We also see not only Christ, but of course, Christ's ambassadors, the apostles in the first century, we have seen, for example, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, uh, this summary of life in the early church, and there it describes the church listening to the apostles' teaching. Throughout the uh, book of Acts, we'll continue to see uh, references to not only their uh, preaching, but also their teaching, and those two things are often coordinated. Uh, I'll say something in a moment about the distinction between them, but teaching and preaching in the church are, are coordinate functions and the apostles engage in this throughout their ministries. Uh, again, just without reading the references uh, or the, the full passages, the citations include uh, Acts 5.42, 13.1, 15.35, 28, 31. And so you see throughout the book, again, the apostles are engaged in this function of teaching. And yet, it's not limited to God, Christ, and their ambassadors. This is applicable to generally everybody. And this is where we start to broaden the scope of who is actually qualified to teach. The next would be parents. Right? Parents are required to teach. This is not uh, optional. It's something that they must do. And so uh, to some extent, even if not in the narrow sense in which uh, Paul means it in, in the list of qualifications for eldership, it is true that parents must be qualified uh, to teach. So, for example, we see this come up repeatedly uh, in Deuteronomy. So, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 10, the Lord says, Gather the people to me, that I may let them hear my words, so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children so. You see the same thing, of course, even more famously in a couple chapters later in Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 6, after the, the, what's called the Shema, this great confession that the Lord, the Lord your God is one and you shall love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. After that, there's the exhortation to parents to teach the word of God to their children when they sit uh, in the house and when they walk by the way and when they lie down and they, when they rise up. Parents are required to teach their children in accordance with God's teaching. As God teaches Israel, so the parents teach their children. And we have a book of the Bible that is particularly devoted to parental instruction of children. It's called the book of Proverbs. We see throughout the book of Proverbs, the exhortation is from a parent, father and mother, to their children. And so you have their examples of what it looks like for parents to teach their children. Not only are parents uh, required to be teachers, but we can broaden this even further to the entire covenant community. So all of those who profess to be believers are required to teach. We have examples of this uh, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. In Colossians 3, verse 16, Paul tells the Christian community, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So one of the issues uh, of singing psalms and hymns and, and these sorts of things in worship, the reason we do it, one of the reasons we do it, is not only, of course, to praise God. That's true. It's there for that reason. But it's also there because we're actually instructing one another. 
as we store up the word of God in our hearts, as we learn it in song, we're then able to use that to exhort one another. You also have this, of course, in uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. We've been going through the book of Hebrews lately, and here you have, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. So he tells the Christian community there, by this point, you ought to have a firm grasp of basic Christian doctrine to the extent that you're able to teach it to others. But instead, in their case, uh, we have to go back and, and cover the basics again. And so they ought to have been qualified to teach. Now, this doesn't, uh, there's not a one-size-fits-all model here, right? It's obviously true that uh, different people within the Christian community are not going to be competent or qualified to teach other people in the same ways. Different people have different strengths, gifts, and stations in life. Uh, and so we see this actually, for example, in Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, verse 3, uh, we see the exhortation that older women are to teach younger women. So within the covenant community, all believers ought to be exhorting one another to love and to good works. We all ought to be uh, teaching each other the word of God within our own proper stations and places. But it's true that some people are qualified to teach others in specific ways, and that would include, well, older women who have raised families, who know about uh, home life, are then qualified to teach younger women how to do that. The same thing would be true of older men teaching younger men. And that's, of course, appropriate in this context, right? So the, the teaching that occurs here at a men's study is beyond the boundaries of this particular lesson uh, when, we, when we get together. That instruction, that discipleship actually extends to the conversations that you're having with each other, especially as the older men speak to the young men here. Uh, because they're modeling for them how you ought to behave as Christians and how you ought to live your life. And so they're learning doctrine even through those conversations. So we then have, this is about as broad as you can get within the boundaries of the church. Uh, so the, the qualification apt to teach applies in some respect to all of us. And yet, having said that, we know that there are particular offices that Christ gives to his church for teaching. And so there's the broad sense of teaching, and then there's teaching in a much uh, narrower sense. And so I want to consider that uh, just for a moment. In the Old Testament, there were a group of people who were appointed by God specifically to teach Israel God's law. Uh, sometimes we tend to think of prophets as teachers, and certainly that is true. We see, for example, at the beginning of Deuteronomy 4, uh, the reference to prophets teaching. Um, but usually, uh, we, think, we tend to think of priests as those who engage in sacrifice, right? They perform sacrifices. But in the, uh, throughout the Old Testament, priests are actually the ones appointed to teach the people of God. So we see in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 11, God talking to the priesthood, he says, you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. Again, we see uh, in Ezra, Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. Ezra, who is functioning as a priest, had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. We'll also see references of the priesthood teaching in 2 Chronicles 15 and Micah 3. Um, but Ezra is perhaps the preeminent example of the Old Testament teacher. So he's gathering the law of God, he's studying it, he's, he's, he's pouring over it, and then he goes to the people and he explains to them what the text means. Not only that, but there is some evidence to suggest, there's a long-standing tradition, that Ezra actually was responsible in part uh, for organizing the Psalter in the way that it exists for us today. So you have 150 Psalms, and they existed uh, largely, uh, many of them independently of one another. And then Ezra comes along, and he gathers the Psalms into one collection, and he organizes it, which I can't discuss in detail, but uh, he organizes the Psalter in a way that it's useful as a pedagogical device. 
So the Psalter is not organized simply as just 150 Psalms in some random order. It's actually uh, designed for memorization and for instruction. And so Ezra, the priest, is doing what priests are supposed to do. He's teaching the people of God the Word of God. Now, we know, of course, that the priesthood expires. There's no more priesthood. Uh, Eric and I are not priests. Uh, we don't serve that function. That's dead. It's gone. It's never coming back. We have one high priest, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we have the priesthood of all believers. But that doesn't mean that the need for a particular office in the church, a teaching office in the church, is eliminated. It doesn't go away. And so in a special or unique way, uh, the, even as the priesthood passes away, the teaching function of the priesthood is now taken over by ministers. And in a secondary sense, it is also taken over by elders in our denomination. Again, without going into detail, uh, you'll find some Presbyterian denominations that will have a distinction between what are called teaching elders and ruling elders. Uh, you may have heard that before if you're in a Southern Presbyterian uh, church like the PCA. Uh, you'll see the distinction between ruling elders and teaching elders. Um, the very term teaching elders suggests that those particular elders are uniquely qualified to teach. Uh, fair enough. In, in our form of government, we would actually distinguish between ministers and elders. There are no teaching elders and ruling elders. There are elders, and then there are ministers, and ministers are, have this, this preeminent function of teaching. Uh, and yet, elders also must be qualified because they ought to wield the Word of God appropriately. And so as we get into Paul's epistles, we see when he discusses various offices, you'll see over and over and over again the reference to these offices in connection with teaching. So he's covering uh, various spiritual gifts in Romans chapter 12. And there in verse 7, he mentions the one who teaches is to use these uh, gifts in his teaching. Right? So the one who teaches in his teaching. Same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, he's covering spiritual gifts. And he says, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. See the same thing uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And then we get into the uh, pastoral epistles themselves, and you start to see particular instruction given to officers regarding that teaching. Um, so, for example, he limits teaching in the church to men. First Timothy uh, 2.12, I do not permit a woman to teach. Um, you have in chapter 5, verse 17, the reference to elders. Let elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And finally, we can look at Titus chapter 1, verse 9, which is, again, the parallel passage to what we've been looking at in 1 Timothy 3 with the qualifications for <coughs> eldership. And it says this regarding the elder, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict, which again is a teaching function. So we have not only believers, but particularly priests in the Old Testament, as well as prophets. And now we have ministers and elders. That's the who. Now the question is how. What does teaching in the church look like? So if we're narrowing our focus particularly here with implications for these other categories, how do ministers and elders teach? And then, of course, what, we can, what can we derive from this in teaching children or teaching or exhorting one another? I think the best place to go for this uh, is the Westminster Larger Catechism, uh, question and answer uh, 159. And the reason for this is, uh, I'll read the question and then make a few comments on, on how it's applicable. Question 159 of the Larger Catechism, how is the Word of God to be preached by those that are called thereunto? So you say, well, this, this question is not about teaching, it's about preaching. Uh, and as I said a moment ago, there is a distinction. Uh, without uh, giving an exhaustive account of that distinction, I think it's sufficient here to say that teaching involves, in a pure sense, the impartation of information. 
that's what teaching is. So when you have someone who's teaching, what he's doing is he's giving doctrine. He's getting up and explaining to his audience, okay, these are particular teachings of the Word of God. It's simple, factual information, and you're imparting that information, and people, of course, are going to do with it what they will. Uh, preaching is, is, a different, is a different animal. Uh, it's supposed to be. So preaching requires the impartation of information. You're conveying certain doctrine, doctrines. You're conveying certain truths. But it goes beyond merely conveying certain truths. Uh, preaching, if done well, uh, is designed to move the hearts of the audience to action. And so the preacher is someone who ought to be uh, on fire for the Word of God. He's zealous for the particular text that he's preaching. That's reflected in his own heart. It's sincere. And that spills out of him and is conveyed to the audience so that they too, in hearing these doctrines, are impacted by the, the gravitas of the teaching. And they too want to go and, and, and live likewise. That's when preaching is done well. I'm, I'm setting this up as, as, a, as an ideal, not necessarily something that preachers uh, attain to, but uh, that is the distinction. So the distinction between simply imparting information versus actually moving your audience uh, to desire to live in a certain way. And yet, that because there is the impartation of information in both of these cases, I think this is uh, useful to consider if we're going to consider how we ought to teach. Well, this is a, a good place to start. So the answer to that question in the larger catechism, question 159, how is the word of God to be preached by those that are called thereunto? And the answer is, they that are called to labor in the ministry of the word are to preach sound doctrine. We'll come back to the what in a moment. So that's the what, sound doctrine. They are to preach diligently. And it goes on to define diligently as in season and out of season. So if you are teaching as an officer of the church, or if you're teaching as a parent to a child or any of these other contexts, you are to teach diligently, that is to say, in season and out of season. It doesn't matter whether it's popular or whether it's unpopular. It doesn't matter if that's what people want to hear or what they don't want to hear. That doesn't matter. You're supposed to teach the whole word of God in season and out of season at every time, whether it's popular or not. That's a particularly dif uh, difficult thing, uh, especially in our time. Uh, you can feel, if you're teaching, you're going to feel certain pressures. You're going to feel uh, a certain impulse to avoid this topic or avoid this particular teaching uh, and to focus on this particular one over here. And that's a constant struggle and a constant battle. But the exhortation is plain. We are to teach diligently in season and out of season. We are to teach plainly. It goes on to define plainly as not in the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. This is particularly important. There can be a tendency within the church, uh, I think less so now than, than, than perhaps in, in previous centuries, but there's a, there's a tendency or was a tendency uh, for ministers uh, to start speaking in a vocabulary that did not connect with their audience, but that belonged within the academy. You'll see, for example, in the 18th century, you'll see Anglican priests, they're effectively giving philosophical discourses from the pulpit. Uh, they're having these philosophical discourses, metaphysical discussions from the pulpit. That's not the place for it, because that belongs in the academy. It's fine to do. There's nothing wrong with it. It belongs in the academy. And they're trying to sound uh, smarter than they actually are. And they're trying to give their audience a uh, they're trying to give their audience effectively what is a man-made worldview, man-made philosophy, instead of doing what Scripture tells us to do, uh, which is teach plainly or preach plainly. The Bible is a fairly plain book. Of course, there are complications and there are things that have to be explained, which is why Christ gives teachers to his church. But as far as the basics are concerned, the language is pretty simple. So let's not overcomplicate this. Um, uh, we've been going through, of course, in the adult Sunday school class, the Gospel of John, and I've mentioned before there that the Gospel of John is one of the plainest texts in Scripture. It's really easy to get. It's not hard. You have two options here. You can either believe Jesus is who he says he is, or you can be in rebellion and under, and under condemnation. It doesn't get any simpler than that. 
Um, so let's not overcomplicate this and let's try to keep it as, as simple and plain as possible. And its power then comes not because it's something that's particularly sophisticated. Its power is not because uh, it belongs in the academy or appeals to the sensibilities of, uh, of a ruling class. It's powerful because of the work of the spirit. It's powerful because it is simple, plain language that the spirit then applies to the minds and hearts of the audience so that they go and live accordingly. So teaching, preaching ought to be as plain and clear and simple as possible. The teacher or the preacher must teach or preach faithfully. It defines faithfully as making known the whole counsel of God. So this is related uh, to the earlier point about being diligent in season and out of season. So not only do we, uh, must we preach the word of God at all times or teach the word of God at all times if we hold the office, uh, uh, one of these offices in the church, it's also the case that we have to preach faithfully. That is to say, we have to preach the whole counsel of God. You don't get to pick and choose. Um, you've probably heard this before. This is one of the reasons why expository preaching is so useful. Uh, it's why Eric and I will preach through an entire book of the Bible, because if you preach through the entire, uh, an entire book of the Bible, you can't avoid the hard passages. You're not allowed to. It forces you to sit down and wrestle with them, and it forces you to say uh, what the text says to your audience, whether you feel like it or not. So being faithful to the text means being faithful to the whole counsel of God. Next, it tells us that the, the teacher or preacher ought to teach or preach wisely. Uh, it defines wisely here as applying themselves to the necessities and the capacities of the hearers. So wisdom here is the idea of connecting means to ends. Right? So in the traditional sense, wisdom has to do with uh, directing uh, certain means to certain ends and knowing how those two uh, relate. So a wise teacher, a wise preacher ought to be able to say, okay, this is where I want to get my audience. This is what they need to believe. This is what the information I'm trying to convey to them. And I understand who my audience is. And so this is the way I need to articulate it in order to get them to that point. Okay. Next, the teacher or preacher ought to preach or teach zealously with fervent love to God and the souls of his people. Uh, that, of course, is particularly important with preaching. It ought to be present in teaching to, to some extent. Uh, it, here it's particularly tied to, to preaching. Of course, we ought to do all that we do out of fervent love for God and a, con, uh, and a, a concern for the souls of the people in our care. And so that's going to come across naturally in teaching, or, or should at least. And finally, teaching or preaching ought to be sincere. That is to say, it ought to aim at God's glory and the conversion of people their edification, and their salvation. So we have here uh, a particular end in view, the purpose of teaching and preaching. So what is your purpose if you are a teacher, if you're a parent teaching your children, if you're an officer in the church teaching a congregation? The aim, of course, as in all things, is to glorify God. It's the conversion, edification, and salvation of the people in your care. That's particularly, of course, teaching as it applies within our discussion, spiritual teaching, uh, teaching the whole counsel of God, teaching the word of God. The purpose is really, again, quite simple. We want to see people saved and we want to see them built up in their faith. Uh, everything beyond that is, is, is just uh, extraneous. It's unnecessary. Uh, this is the goal, right? Can, can we convey the word of God in such a way that the spirit uses it to save people and then sanctify people? It's that basic. There are a number of passages we won't look at now that, uh, uh, this, that indicate um, what we've just discussed there in slightly different ways uh, as far as the method of teaching. So you can consider, for example, uh, the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, uh, the law of the Lord is going to go forth from Jerusalem. Uh, this suggests that uh, the idea is the church has a central teaching function. Uh, the church is entrusted with the authority uh, to teach. And then you see in Titus 2, uh, the instructions to Titus to be a model of good works. So he's not only teaching by his words, but he's also teaching by his behavior, emulating uh, or, or being a model for, for younger men in the church to emulate. And finally, what do they teach? 
This one's pretty simple. Within this particular context, we've seen that they are to teach sound doctrine. Teachers in the church are to teach sound doctrine. Where do we get sound doctrine? From where do we get sound doctrine is scripture, right? That's our only rule of faith and practice. Now, of course, it's scripture as interpreted within the context of natural moral law. So we don't step into the church and all of a sudden forget everything that we know about the world. Uh, that would be ridiculous. But the particular exhortation, which we've already seen, is to teach the word of God. It has always been that way since the beginning. Uh, we see it, saw with respect to priests in Leviticus uh, 10, they were to teach the law of the Lord to Israel. In chapter uh, in Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, we see Ezra devoting himself to study the law of the Lord so that he can teach Israel. In Nehemiah 8, we see the leadership of Israel standing before the congregation and expositing scripture for them. We see this over and over and over again. The psalmist, again, in Psalm 119, we saw him calling for God to teach him, right? Teach me, Lord. And he specifically says, what does he want God to teach him? The scriptures. The whole chapter, Psalm 119, is about scripture. Isaiah 2, 3, again, the promise is that the law of the Lord would go forth from Jerusalem, that is to say, from the church. And finally, Isaiah chapter 8, verse, uh, uh, cha chapter 8, verse 20, Isaiah, of course, warns, he says, uh, the Lord says, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. So teachers in the church must teach what scripture teaches, nothing more, nothing less. That is the boundary of the authority of the church, is the Word of God. That's what we teach. You see this again uh, all throughout the pastoral epistles, perhaps most famously in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 into chapter 4. You're familiar uh, with the famous uh, celebration of Scripture's qualities in 2 Timothy 3. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be competent, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, Scripture is the standard. Paul sets up Scripture as your doctrinal and moral standard. And then he goes on to tell Timothy in the beginning of chapter 4 that you need to preach this word. Notice what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. I'll start in verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So the qualification at to teach uh, is not particularly complicated. We have here models for us, God, Christ, and his apostles. Everyone, to some extent, has an obligation and some experience teaching, whether you know it or not, parents, believers, and you have your Old Testament models and then your New Testament uh, offices. We have how we ought to teach, which is, again, not that different in some respects from, from preaching. And most of those are pretty common sense, although it's good to review. I would go back if you want to and consider the larger catechism. And then the what is really quite simple. We are to teach Scripture, the whole counsel of God, the law of the Lord. Nothing more, nothing less. So, does anybody have any questions or comments on this? So far, so good. All right. <laughs> good, good. Well, uh, that's, again, that's about as basic as it comes. Um, th this is not a particularly sophisticated uh, qualification. Uh, is, is the elder, someone who's seeking the office of elder, does he know how to do this? Can he take the word of God and explain it clearly, faithfully to the people in his care for their edification and for the glory of God? Um, if there are no other questions or comments, I'll leave it there, and we'll go ahead and close in prayer. Yes. I don't know how, how easy it is to answer this question, but um, uh, I guess I wonder about the degree of pretty much almost all of these qualifications, including yeah. able to teach. Yeah. You know, what is that? What should that look like? Yeah. Seems a little bit right. There's one, one church and they say, oh, well, this man is able yep. to teach, but sure. um, into another church yeah. and they look at the same man and they say, oh, that man is not able to teach. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, 
yeah, contextually, the, both of those could be true. Um, so yeah, so apt to teach is uh, a qualification that, and these qualifications again can't be quantified, right? You can't put a number on it, you can't measure it. Uh, so you have to exercise some wisdom and the session of any given church, the existing officers have to exercise that wisdom. Uh, so you see, for example, uh, Paul tells Titus that he leaves him behind in Crete so that he can appoint elders who are qualified. Okay, he's got to exercise wisdom. He's, Paul gives him the list. Now go and pick out men that seem to you to fit those qualifications. So the session has to be able to determine, okay, is this person qualified or not? Um, and that's going to differ from perhaps church to church. It's going to differ from historical context to historical context. Um, I remember reading in the, in the uh, Reformation era, uh, there was a, it's actually Lutheran, but there was a, a Lutheran book of church order and they were trying to revise or reform worship in uh, you know, some of the Scandinavian countries. And one of the issues that came up was the existing priests were not particularly well educated. And they had all, always basically just leaned on rote recitation of liturgical material. And they didn't have any understanding of the scriptures. So what do you do in that situation? Well, the response was they can use uh, existing forms of prayer, effectively a prayer book. You can use that as a crutch, right? It's a, it's a crutch, but they needed it because they haven't exercised that muscle for a very long time in, in, the, in the Western European church. So as you're learning to exercise that muscle, you need something to lean on. And so it's a really good idea then to have the, the prayer book. Now, fast forward to a Scottish Presbyterian context in the 17th century, and they're going to tell you, you cannot be a minister and depend on the prayer book because as a minister, you ought to be qualified to preach your own sermon, right? To exposit the text. And you ought to be able to pray without having a prayer written out in front of you. Different context. Uh, so the, the Scottish Presbyterian Church can say, well, yeah, we're not going to allow a guy who might have been fine as a minister uh, in, uh, say, you know, Norway, Sweden, Finland, right, in the 16th century. Uh, that's a different thing from a 17th century Scottish Presbyterian minister. Um, so you're right. I think you can't quantify it. You have to make, with all of these, you have to make, attempt to make reasonable decisions based on what you, your needs are, what the needs of the church are, what you have available to you. Um, I think that's fair. If, Eric, you want to add to that? But. Is that fair? Anything else? All right. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Uh, Father, we praise you and we thank you for your word. We pray that uh, insofar as we are called to teach it and to transmit your doctrine to anyone around us, whether uh, fellow believers or whether children or whether the congregates in our care, we pray that you would mm, equip us, that we would know your word thoroughly and that by your spirit we would be able to communicate it clearly uh, when necessary, that you would give us precisely the words to say. We also pray, Lord, that you would grant us strength and fortitude to declare your word in season and out of season. We would not shrink away from uh, any portions of Scripture, particularly the hard parts. Indeed, we pray that we would be inflamed with zeal for your word, that we would love it and delight in it, and that we would see it actually applied in this local congregation and throughout your, uh, the world. We pray that we would consequently see the blessings that come from that word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.